Thanks, everybody. Uh, so my name is Andrew Wiseman. Uh, I'm with MapTime DC, which is kind of a local organization. It's a nonprofit all over the world to teach people mapping and geography, and also Mapping DC, which is the local OSM community in DC. So we're going to talk about a project we did, uh, me and a couple of friends and colleagues in uh, our neighborhood, basically in Washington, DC, and kind of how to use OSM for neighborhood development, for neighborhood projects, things like that. Or another kind of way to put it is don't just map. Collecting data is fantastic, but you could do a whole lot more. So a little bit about field surveys. This is probably old news to everybody, but just in case. Uh, and this is also some of the tools we like to do. So basically, you're collecting data in the field. Uh, Fieldpapers.org is a great tool we like to use. Uh, you collect data, you kind of walk around with it, you know, write notes on your piece of paper you printed out, then you go back to the library, community center, wherever, and enter that data back into OSM. It's a great tool, it's free. Uh, check it out if you haven't already. There's also a lot of apps you can use. Uh, Mapillary and OpenStreetView are kind of do-it-yourself street view imagery. Uh, Dale mentioned that in the previous talk. There's also a bunch of data collection apps. Uh, I like Pushpin, it's really simple. Uh, I think it only works for iPhone, unfortunately, but it's a pretty cool tool. There's also a bunch for other phones and, and for uh, various uh, devices and things like that. And Fish in the Neighborhood is a funny little business in, in my neighborhood, so I thought it was funny to put that up there. Um, so field surveys are fantastic, they're really fun. Uh, you also notice a lot of things you wouldn't normally notice. You know, like I don't have kids, for example, so when I walk around the neighborhood, I don't really notice the kid infrastructure, the playgrounds and childcare and stuff like that. You know, I don't go to the salons, so I don't really notice the nail salons. When you're out there mapping and things like that, you notice all that stuff. Wow, there's a lot more things that I didn't really realize was here in my neighborhood. So you kind of get a good sense of what's actually there. It's also great for teaching geography, you know, with young people or even just kind of anybody. You're kind of doing geography at a one-to-one -one scale, is how Stephen, one of my, uh, co-conspirators uh, describes it. So what happens next after the field survey? So kind of our idea was let's connect with local groups. We can try to do a lot more with this information we're collecting. So these kids are from a group called Mommy's TLC, which we worked with on one of the projects. I'll talk about them a little bit. Uh, so basically it's kind of a young, it's, a, it's an NGO that does all kinds of kind of community projects. Uh, what we were involved with was a summer project uh, around entrepreneurship. So they talked to local people, uh, talked to these little these students, uh, they're mostly like middle school and high school students. And they basically went around and talked to local business owners. Hey, how did you start your business? Uh, what's your background? Why did you choose this business? They also did things like taught each other uh, elevator pitches, how to write resumes, things like that, which is pretty neat. And there's also a mapping portion of it. So they do something called a business inventory where they walk around and kind of write all this information down, collect all the information in the neighborhood, which is great. But that information sits on a PDF on this organization's website. So unless you knew it was already there, you probably would never find it. So it's a lot of great information that just kind of sits there and just sort of gets stale a little bit. So our idea was, hey, why don't we do this same kind of project, but use OpenStreetMap instead of having it sit on your PDF on your hard drive, and they said, that's great, let's do it. So a little bit about George Avenue, the neighborhood we worked in. Um, so there's a lot of small retail, interesting little businesses, kind of funky buildings like these ones with the concrete blocks. We're not really sure what those are, but we mapped them out. Uh, there's also some little hip new places. This place sells tinned fish, which apparently is a thing. I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, there's kind of fancy condos are coming up as well. Uh, and then there's also abandoned buildings. There's lots of different things kind of on this block. That's another abandoned building. Those little stickers you see on the windows, those are sort of official city things that say this building is vacant, uh, taxed at a higher rate, which is something the city does to kind of make sure that people try to do stuff with their vacant uh, businesses. Uh, in this case, there's also some art that people were doing. This is a project where they were you know, kind of making these buildings look a little bit nicer by doing some art and some history, things like that. It's also a pretty diverse area. There's a plurality, plurality African-American. There's also a lot of Latinos and um, Asians and things like that. There's a little Vietnamese community in the neighborhood. So first we needed some data. Um, there wasn't that much base data in DC. This was in 2014, I think, we started this. So we set up a tasking manager project and had volunteers kind of do remote mapping, add those buildings, things like that. A little bit later, there was a DC building import from the city's own GIS supply, which was great. So now there's lots of buildings there, lots of data. Uh, and then we used the local form they had. This is the form they are, they've used for their previous sort of business, uh, business inventories. Kind of collect all that information, went out with the students, filled all those things out, and then came back to uh, the community center and entered the data in OpenStreetMap. So there's a few of the students, there's us, some of the kids, uh, Steven's here, someone in the audience, there's Steven. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty fun, it was great. The one kid in the back is making a funny face, so he liked it, which is good. <laughs> um, so you know, we had 20 new mappers, which is great. We added almost 300 businesses to the map. We also did a little bit more with the students. Uh, the one the picture on the left is actually at Mapbox, which is a mapping company that's based in DC. We took them there to sort of show them, hey, you can do this for a living, you know, there's actually jobs behind this and things like that. One of the kids like, this is awesome, I wanna do this when I grow up, which is pretty cool to hear. And then the one on the right is, um, there was a community review meeting, which is something they do kind of frequently in DC where people come together and say, hey, what's in our neighborhood, what do we like, what don't we like, what should we have more of, what should we have less of, things like that. And the students presented their findings there, which is great. 
So we had some lessons learned, I'm not gonna go over all of them. Uh, they're actually on the wiki, OSM wiki, you can check it out. But one of the things we sort of found most interesting or, or maybe difficult was that, you know, mapping is pretty fast, but the organizing part is, is slower. It's a little bit tougher. You know, some people have different schedules, some people don't use email, they prefer phone, all these different kinds of things. So it took a little while to kind of get into the flow and get things going, but once we did, it was, worked pretty well. So that's all great. Created all this data, we got kids mapping, which is fantastic. Uh, but it was sort of a one-off program. Once that summer program was over, the kids went back to school, they went back to their friends, things like that. Which was, you know, which we kind of expected, but also it's a little bit, you know, that's too bad. What, what else can we do? So that was kind of our idea. What else can we do to kind of keep this going, do more of the data, get more people kind of mapping and doing good stuff? And one of our ideas was to work with local groups. These are things like neighborhood organizations, chamber of commerce, main street or business improvement districts, if you have those in your neighborhood. Just local organizations that do stuff, that have kind of a mission, a goal, want to get, thing, get things done. They often have a longer term view of things. They kind of know that it's not just a short thing we're gonna finish and be done. They have lots of ideas, lots of connections. They have volunteers, they have local knowledge, all these kind of good things you want to do mapping. So that was basically our idea. You can facilitate neighborhood discussion, raise questions and suggest projects by, doing, by using OpenStreetMap. But what are those projects? What are those questions? And that's why you gotta work with the local organizations. We don't really know necessarily. We know how to collect data, but we don't necessarily know what the, what the questions, the problems are to sort of figure out. But local organizations often do. So first we needed some more data, so we did some more field surveys. This was a Mapping DC, a little event we did. I also do like a neighborhood blog, so I wrote about it and people came to show up, which was great. Mapped out some more things. Uh, Steven and I, the smiling guy, we did a few more, kind of just me and him walking around collecting data. Uh, because, you know, you want to have as much data as possible before you do uh, kind of more things. And then we also decided to use CardoDB. Uh, which, well, now it's called Cardo, but then it was CardoDB to sort of make kind of easier to understand maps. This is, this is land use, you've got abandoned buildings, you've got residential, commercial, stuff like that. Because showing this to kind of a new person to mapping or someone who isn't really familiar with OpenStreetMap is a lot easier than showing that, right? It's a lot more clear what's what, you know, what are these little symbols, how come this isn't labeled, stuff like that. So that was kind of an easier way to get people to understand sort of what we're trying to show and, and the idea behind mapping. We found this local organization, George Avenue Thrive. Uh, their mission statement's kind of on there. Uh, the, you know, they basically have a lot of projects, they want to do a lot of things, which is great. So we presented it to them and they said, that's interesting, I got some ideas, but they had some questions. You probably heard these questions before, why don't we use Google Maps? How, what about government data? Why don't we use that stuff? It already exists. And we had to kind of explain, you know, well, Google Maps is often a little bit out of date, it's not as detailed as we would like, we can't add things to it, we can't download data, make maps with it, all these different kinds of things. Uh, DC has a pretty good government data source, which is great, but it's also, uh, sometimes it's a little bit out of date as well, and you know, GIS data is not always perfect. So one of the ideas they came up with was there's actually a city facade improvement program for, for uh, businesses. Businesses can apply, they'll make their facades look nicer, look the building look nicer. This is kind of the before and after, so you can see it looks a whole lot nicer than before. It was kind of a little run down, kind of needed some paint, and they got this grant. This wasn't from our program, but this is the idea to map out, hey, we can map out all these businesses that need facade improvements, and then talk about the program, kind of use that for some analysis and some, some further projects. Uh, there's also a bunch of abandoned buildings. Uh, it's interesting to map them out for a couple reasons. That sticker, like I mentioned, means that this building is abandoned. It can be taxed at a higher rate. But also, we can talk to those local business owners and say, hey, we realize your, your building's abandoned. Have you thought about using it for something else in the meantime before you develop it into whatever it is you're going to develop it into? Uh, which is actually kind of a common thing in, on this, in this neighborhood. Uh, this example, this is a, a grocery store, old grocery store that's been closed for a few years. And they're actually turning into a mushroom farm and microgreens farm, just temporarily, which is interesting. So and basically, like, the developer owns it, developers eventually gonna probably build something else, condos or whatever, but the neighborhood said, hey, why don't you just, instead of letting the city open and empty, why don't you do something with it? So that's kind of the idea with mapping out these vacant buildings, we can get those people to do more good stuff with it. Uh, another kind of abandoned storefront, this is actually owned by Howard University, which is in the neighborhood, so it's kind of interesting. You know, hey, we can talk to Howard and say, hey, how come, why do you have all these empty storefronts? Let's do something with it. Uh, another idea they had was uh, finding places that murals could be put. The city also has a mural program. Uh, this is a cool one on a business, um, it's called the Mothership, you know, it's like the Mothership is landing. It's kind of an interesting mural, sort of a commentary on gentrification a little bit, which is kind of interesting. Um, so what if we find out all the big walls there, that exist and say, hey, would you like a mural on this? The city will pay for it. And this is kind of the field papers we used when we were out there. Um, the circles and the X's are places where there are security cameras. So the, the city also has a security camera grant program. Well, they'll uh, rebate a certain amount of money if businesses put up security cameras, because then, you know, it helps prevent crime and things like that. I've also got some notes on there, like which ones need facade improvements, this one can use a mural, stuff like that. So why should you actually do this with local groups? I kind of mentioned this before, but they often have all these ideas and know about all these connections and opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily know if you're just the person who's mapping in the area. Uh, they're also gonna be there for a long time, they really invested. 
and they know a lot of local people. Uh, one of the examples we found is we were walking around trying to figure out what one of these buildings was, and there was a guy hanging out in the corner, and one of our volunteers said, oh, hey, Mr. Jones, what's going on? Hey, do you know what this building is? And Mr. Jones knew the whole story. He knew, like, who used to own it, what happened to it, what, you know, what it used to be, all these different kinds of things. So this is, folks, this is stuff you wouldn't really know if you're just out there mapping, but if you actually have people with you who know the local community and things like that, you get a lot more detail, a lot more interesting information that is helpful. So one of the things we learned is strike with the iron is hot. Uh, Dale always uses funny gifts, so I put one in. This is not that funny, but at least it's kind of representative. <laughs> um, but you know, the idea is like you also want to kind of not wait. Like people say, okay, let's go map. Great, okay, how about, how about this week? Let's go, let's do it, you know? But then once you map out, you want to say, okay, here's the results. We did this. Great job, guys. Here's the map. So what are you doing next? What's the next project? What's your next idea? So to keep people engaged, keep people going, keep people interested, this is the same data from the field papers, uh, the murals, the cameras, things like that. So we have a bunch of next steps for ourselves, um, kind of things we need to do to sort of do more of, the, more of the interesting information, interesting projects we want to do. But you notice that most of these are not OSM. So those three are not really OSM at all. Those are kind of more other steps, which is interesting, I think. So these are kind of my blue sky ideas, too. Um, you know, what if you map sort of change over time using something like a planet OSM file? What used to be in this neighborhood? What's, what's there now? What, what, what left? What came in? What are the changes? Why did it change that way? It's kind of interesting. And then people ask about this, you know, hey, it'd be cool if we had like a website, like the neighborhood organization website that has a directory of all the businesses. And it'd be interesting if there was somehow some way to kind of link that directly to like live OSM data so it's always kind of up to date. Uh, I don't know how to do that, but it's an interesting idea. That's why I have the kind of kooky name up there. Uh, we had a few technical best practices. So if you want to do it yourself, and I recommend it highly, CardoDB is fantastic. Um, it's a little time consuming. We had to export it to Overpass and then to QGIS and the CardoDB, but it worked pretty well and it's all free, which is great. And then one thing we found, the disused building tag makes the building disappear from the map, uh, which is confusing for people who are new. Why is this, uh, why is this like, like this? How come it's not on there? So we had to sort of figure out a better way to do it. Um, Non-technical things, you want to map ahead of time a lot, so there's lots of data available. And then it's also easier if you're part of a bigger organization too. Uh, say, hey, my name is Andrew, I'm with Mapping DC, versus hi, we're Andrew and Steven, we'd like to map. People are kind of more likely to respond and say, okay, great, let's do it. Uh, it also brings a little bit more kind of like official, officialness. And make sure you bring non-mappers with you when you're doing this too, because they also notice a lot of things that you wouldn't know. Uh, a few takeaways for you guys, it's really fun, but it's almost more fun and kind of more rewarding when you do something useful with the, uh, with the data, and definitely work with those local groups, very important. And one of the things I was kind of thinking, you know, we often collect all this data and hope that somebody's gonna do something with it, but sometimes that, that's you, sometimes you have to do something with it. Nobody else is going to sometimes. I think kind of the last sort of takeaways, the more folks are actually doing the mapping, the more representative it'll be. And kind of a cheesy phrase, but I think it's accurate. You know, do it. Be the change you want to be. You can do it. That's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, it definitely took some time. That's a good point. Especially um, like when they were editing directly in the ID editor, it's pretty easy to move things around and screw up, you know, polygons and relations and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things we found is we have a whole bunch of volunteers, and they're always kind of hovering around. It makes it easier to make sure they're not doing bad stuff. But no one, would, no one like was purposely messing us stuff up. It was just kind of, oh, I, I pushed this button. I don't know what happened. Stuff like that. Thanks. Uh, I actually grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is like a mile from Georgia Avenue, and I'm uh, amazed after hearing the keynote this morning about all the stuff that's happening in Africa and other parts of the, of the world, and this is right in the middle of Washington, D.C., uh, and there's actually stuff we can do right here, which is amazing. Uh, my question is, how did you pick the Georgia Avenue corridor? Maybe you said it at the beginning and I just missed it. I'm curious because uh, it is, uh, how I remember it was, it was a very underdeveloped neighborhood. It was, you know, with all the blown out buildings and stuff like that. Why, why Georgia Avenue, why there? Yeah, part of it, um, this is because that, that's what the project was, that first project, the Youth Mappers one. Uh, I also live pretty close to there, so it's kind of you know my backyard and I want to do things there. And there's also just like a lot of neighborhood organizations. There's a lot of interest in like local groups that are doing stuff. Uh, but you're right, it is definitely like a changing area, which is also why it's kind of important to map. You know, this is, you might say it's gentrifying, it's changing a whole lot. So I think it's important to kind of collect that information as well. Did you find that the groups you worked with had ideas of what to map, or did you really have to kind of seed 
with ideas? Yeah, it was a little of both. I mean, we sort of first said, hey, um, we could map out land use or building types, and they said, okay, that's interesting. Hey, how about, well, actually, there's all those other projects. How about this? What about, like, the mural thing and the um, graffiti thing and the um, security cameras, all these different things? Those are all their ideas. We just kind of proposed the idea, hey, you can map things. What are things that will be useful to map? And then people will have their own ideas, their own projects, which is kind of, I think, the best way to do it. Um, I'm really interested and in, kind of inspired by this project, especially the community integration into like the local organizations. I wonder for the for the kids themselves, what was your impression as far as like their current levels of like digital literacy and familiarity with technology in general? And would you say that like the mapping served as like a fairly intuitive way for them to kind of get a glimpse into like how technology like really actually works? I can't think of a better way to describe that. Yeah, it kind of varied. I mean, some kids were really good and they really got it and they kind of jumped in immediately. Some kids had, they hadn't really used a computer very much, so they had a hard time using the mouse even. So that could be something interesting too. You could do like a computer skills class and then do mapping after that, something like that. Uh, also, one thing that was interesting, a lot of people had a hard time with emails, like they don't really use email that much. They're more text message, Facebook, stuff like that. So people had a hard time registering because they don't know their email address or forgot their password or something like that. So it kind of definitely varied. Uh, Somewhere around the middle of the slideshow, you had a slide of the things you'd learned, and it went by kind of fast, and I didn't get all of those. Sure. Let me find where it was. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, I think I, I went by that quick prick because it's also on the OSM wiki. I think that was why. I didn't want to just read everything on there. And there's actually like a 20 of them on the wiki. So is this the one? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, just search for that George Avenue mapping on the wiki, and you'll see even more on there. Any other questions for Andrew? Hello. Um, Thanks. How are you? Was attendance with the kids and then also at the different um, like community talks consistent or was it sort of not always the same? I just know from being engaged in DC like that that it's sometimes difficult to get consistent like uh, attendance. That's just yeah, that's true. We started with maybe 20 students. By the end, it was maybe 10. People just kind of, feel, you know, they, they get busy. They have other stuff going on. So I think it's also good to start with as many people as possible at first. And then even if it filters out a little bit, you still have enough people to do stuff. Hi, Andrew. Um, in Mexico, we're doing some projects in the ones we are also trying to map things to improve in the cities. Um, I remember uh, that you mentioned uh, the from uh, parts of the of the businesses. Also, we are trying to see uh, sidewalks in the ones they are not in good conditions. So, how do you do? That? Do you uh, take a picture with your tagging and uh, also use your field paper? How how you manage that to like then show it in Carto DB and other tools? Yeah, we mostly just did field papers because uh, it was kind of the easiest way to do it. But yeah, you definitely could do that with photos and connecting things like that and putting the photos into CardoDB, for example. Uh, we haven't done that, but that's something you totally could do, yeah. A lot of times um, companies, maybe some represented in, in this room, are, are interested in how to engage with the communities they work in. And a lot of the companies that are here have pretty significant mapping things. Based on your experience, would that be a good or a bad if like a company said, hey, we want to take on a project to do some of this community mapping? Is, is that all good or all bad or somewhere in between? I think it's, yeah, Dale's got a thumbs up. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely good as long as it's, it's the community leading the project ver versus the opposite. You know, like, hey, here's the things we're going to map for you versus, hey, what can we map together? I think it's definitely much better to do it with the community as sort of supporting rather than like leading that. Yeah. Sure, definitely. All that, as Dale said. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, please Thanks. provide Thanks. Andrew with a warm thank you. And, um, <laughs>